All right. Hello and welcome to our confirmation class uh, for this first class of the new year. We're going to talk about the Bible and how we use it. But before we do that, I want you to uh, I want you to listen to some of these laws that people used to uh, live their lives by in different states. Now you may not know this, but Dave Steer, our associate pastor here, he's from Michigan. Did you know that in Michigan? There's a law currently on the books that the last Sunday in June of every year was named Log Cabin Day. So next time you talk to Dave Steer, make sure you ask him about Log Cabin Day. There's another law. A woman isn't allowed to cut her own hair without her husband's permission. Can you imagine that? Still on the books, but obviously no one goes by that rule anymore. But there was a time <laughs> where there was a rule that said a woman can't cut her own hair without her husband's permission. I think that that's kind of silly. Any person over the age of 12 may have a license for a handgun as long as he or she has not been convicted of a felony. There was at one time a law in Michigan. They only had to be 12 years old to have a handgun. That's very different than today. Now I'm from Iowa. Uh, there's some interesting laws that you might uh, want to know about Iowa, do you know that uh, a man with a mustache is not allowed to kiss a woman in public? I don't know what it was about mustaches, but uh, maybe I think it was more of a rule about kissing in public. <laughs> this one I always think is kind of funny. A minister must obtain a permit to carry liquor across state lines. And of course there they're talking about communion wine, but I think it's kind of funny that, that a uh, a pastor or a minister might be smuggling alcohol outside of the state. And did you know that in Illinois, in our town, that in the city of Joliet, you can be, there was a, still on the books, I think, you can get fined $5 for mispronouncing Joliet as Joliet, because everyone knows that you don't say it like Joliet, you say Joliet or I think you'd get fined if you said Juliet too. Uh, and of course, uh, another little law, you must con contact the police before the entering the city in an automobile. That uh, of course dates back to a time when not very many people had cars. Now it just, it's irrelevant. So what do you think? I want you to answer this question. Talk to a parent, maybe you're doing this with a friend. What what about the Bible? Is it just a, a long list of forgotten laws and rules that applied at one time? It made a lot of sense to live your life that way, but, but now it really doesn't matter because we're different. We, we live different ways. Uh, that, what do you think? Is Bible just a bunch of old laws that don't matter anymore? Or is it, is it something that's timeless, something that we'll always be able to use? And, make a difference in our lives. Discuss that with uh, someone in your family. All right, we're back. <laughs> I want to take you through a, a little uh, story in the Bible. This is found in Second Chronicles chapter 34. So if you guys would turn along with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 34, that is uh, right in the middle of the Old Testament, the history section. In fact, if you uh, open your Bible just about to the first third, you'll find 1st or 2nd Chronicles. And then you can turn to Second Chronicles chapter 34. And you probably have a heading if you're using the student Bible, which I hope you are. Make sure you get a copy of this. Pause the video. Find your copy of this Bible because we're going to be talking about how to use the Bible today. It's pretty important that you have a Bible. If you don't have the student Bible, get uh, stop stop the video, get a copy of mom or dad's uh, a Bible that uh, you can refer to, because I want you to be able to use that as we're talking today. Second Chronicles chapter 34, we're going to hear the story about Josiah, one of the 
kings in Jerusalem. I'm going to read just certain sections of this whole chapter. The first one is just an introduction to who Josiah was, what kind of king he was, what, what uh, just gives a little picture of who he was. Josiah was eight years old. Josiah, this is uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verses 1 to 5. Josiah was, read along with me, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. During the eight years of his reign, the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, Josiah began to seek God of his ancestor David. And then in the twelfth year, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem, destroying all the pagan shrines and Asherah poles and carved idols and cast images. He ordered that all the altars of Baal, not a very good religion, be demolished and that the incense altars which stood above them be broken down. He also made sure that the Asherah poles, the carved idols, and the cast images were smashed and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He burned the bones of the pagan priests on their own altars, and so he purified Judah and Jerusalem. So that was uh, a brief description of who Josiah was. Started his ruling when he was eight years old, but it says in his eighth year, so he's about 16 years old, not much older than you are now, it says he started seeking God. Now this was this is without the Bible, as we'll find out later. He just simply started praying and talking to God and asking God to, to show himself to him. And uh, I think that's pretty remarkable. It's also pretty remarkable that he ruled for 31 years. That's a long time for a king in Jerusalem, especially during the last part of the history. And he was known for getting rid of all the, the pagan idols, which is pretty important because some of those pagan cults uh, they they believed in child sacrifice. They believed in in just really disturbing stuff that that was not pleasing to God and is actually illegal today. You couldn't even do it if you wanted to. Um, and so it's very important that he purified Israel. Now let's read a little bit more about him. We're going to skip ahead to verses ten and eleven. Read along with me. He entrusted the money. So. He wanted to, not only to purify Israel, but he wanted to uh, um, rebuild the temple. So he raised taxes to rebuild the temple and he entrusted the, the money from those taxes to the men assigned to supervise the restoration of the Lord's temple. Then he paid the workers who did the repairs and renovations of the temple. They hired carpenters and builders who purchased finished stones for walls and timbers for the altars and the beams. And they restored what the earlier kings of Judah had allowed to fall into ruin. So not only was he someone that, that got rid of some of the bad practices, the stuff that people were doing that they know they shouldn't have done, he rebuilt the temple, which is a big deal. They, uh, people had let the church fall in disrepair. He rebuilt it. Let's skip on. First 34, verses 14 to 15, 19 to 21. This is the part that, uh, where it gets interesting. While they were bringing out the money, collected at the Lord's temple, Hilkiah, the priest, found the book of the law of the Lord that was written by Moses. Hilkiah said to some guy, the court secretary, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Then Hilkiah gave the scroll to Saphon. Saphon took the scroll to the king and reported to the king and reported, your officials are doing everything that you asked them to do. And he gives them the scroll, the king, they read it to him. And when the king heard what was written in the law, he tore his clothes in despair and gave these orders to Hilkiah, the son of, to the, the priests. Make sure that uh, we're going to read this. And basically what they did is they, they, uh, they read the, the book of the Bible, something that had been lost, like generations of people had, had stopped reading the Bible. They were their connection to God was simply connect, tied to old traditions and practices, the pilgrimages and, and some of the religious activities. Could you imagine if our church, um, we never read the Bible and the pastor, we just did things because that's the way we always had done them? Well, that's what happened generation after generation. And then they, they get to this point where they open, they find in the, the temple, be like us going behind the altar and finding a Bible for the first time, 
Uh, for them, it was just the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So they, they found the Bible in the temple, and they, they, the king reads it, and he realizes, oh my goodness, these rules matter. This applies to the to our this is this is like how you stay connected to God, and this is this is history worth remembering. And so he uh, is, laments. He's very sad that that it, the nation had gotten to a point where they had stopped reading the Bible, or they'd forgotten about it completely. And then uh, he makes sure that everyone reads it, and we can uh, in verse 34, 29 to 33, we just get a little snapshot of what that looks like. Then the, the king summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the Levites and all the people from the greatest to the least. There the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple, and the king took his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commands, laws, and decrees with all his heart and soul. And he promised to obey all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll. And he required everyone in Jerusalem and the people of Benjamin to make a similar pledge. The people of Jerusalem did so, renewing their covenant with God and the God of their ancestors. So this is a pretty big deal. And we're going to learn about exactly what that covenant was um, when we talk about the Old Testament in a couple of weeks. Um, but really, it's, basically, it's the Ten Commandments. You guys know those. We've talked about those. But also a lot of other um, just ways of living life that the people had forgotten about and uh, kind of promises from God that if, if you do these things, like wash your hands before you eat a meal, you won't get sick. I'm sure they were still following that rule, but there were a lot of other things like that that they had forgotten about. And so they uh, were very thankful to have God's word again. What do you think? It, can you imagine a time? What would our world look like if we didn't have the Bible? We just forgot about it. I think there'd be a lot of other philosophies or important people Oof, we might just be following the the whatever the celebrities right thought was important that could get scary pretty quick the bible is important it's not just a a list of old laws that don't matter anymore just like it was important to the king josiah important enough that he he reread it and and it changed the whole way he lived his life same thing's true of us uh, the, the Bible, we may we may forget about it from time to time. We may we may uh, not read it that often, or we may not listen to it, or go to church. But there will come times in our life where we we dust it off and we read it again, and we get back into church and um, make sure worship's important to us. And man, it's, it's amazing the difference it makes because it it does matter. It's not just a st bunch of stuff that that mattered at one time and doesn't now. It it is the way in which God speaks to us. And we're going to talk some more about that today. It's not just about the rules either. It's about the promises. Imagine if you went through your whole day and, and you didn't speak to your parents for a week or a month for that matter. How would you start to feel about yourself? I think you'd start to miss that reminder that you matter and that you're loved because our parents, God through our parents tells us we're loved and we're cared for. Same thing with the Bible. We read it not just so that we can have good guidance, good rules to follow, a way to live our lives. We, we do it because we want to remember that what God's doing, not only what we need to do, but what God's doing in our life. So it's laws, but also promises that apply to our life today. You don't have to wonder what, what would God want me to do or what should I do or does God love me? You can read it. It's right there. And when you read the Bible, no matter where the story is, Old Testament, New Testament, picture yourself as the person that God is talking with or working with. Those promises that he gives to those people in the Bible 
are just as true for us today. The way that people experienced God back then is just as true for us today. In fact, that's why we write those stories down so that we can we can know what to expect from God and how he cares for us and loves us. Now, our goal is not to be experts. Our goal is to know the Bible and know how to use it. That's a, sometimes people, when they think of the Bible, they, they think, I don't even want to read it. I don't want to open it up. I don't, I don't want anything to do with that because I, there's no way I could ever be an expert in it. Well, that's never our goal. I'm not an expert in the Bible, and I've been studying it for all my life. I've gone to school for this, but I do know how to use it. And you guys, there are going to be people in your life that if they're ever going to hear God's word or know what, how much God loves them or hear any story about God from the Bible, it, it may be only because you point them to it, whether that's you telling them the story about something you read or actually sitting down with them and saying hey here's here it is this is this is the story of jesus life don't don't just watch the movies and tell let them tell you who jesus was you can actually read what the history of jesus life was and how he treated people and how much uh he shows god's love for us uh by just the way that he he loved people um there's gonna be people in your life that will never know the Bible unless you show it to them. So you don't need to be an expert in the Bible, but you, I'm counting on it. God trusts you with it. You are probably one of the people in your groups of friends growing up that's gonna know how to use it. I know how to open it, know where stuff is, and, and will be confident enough to, to read it and, and uh, ask questions about it. And that really is gonna matter for your friends and your family in the future. So there's a lot of reasons. Um, someone may have never read the Bible. Some people have been taught to be skeptical. Others have literally don't, don't know that it exists. They've, they've never really thought about religion or the fact that God might've written some stuff down. Never underestimate what God can do if you're willing to show someone how to open that Bible. If you're confident in reading it, it will give someone else confidence to read it. Say, so here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the basics of the Bible, and I'm going to do this first part for you because I want you to know how simple it is. When you're thinking about the Bible, most everything that happened in it happened in one area on the earth where you could go visit right now. It's, it's called the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River and the Dead Sea, and right above the Dead Sea is Jerusalem. And man, 80% of the Bible, 80% of the stories and the histories and the things that happened and the people, this re recording of people's encounter with God all happened in that, that small area of the world. And so I'm going to go through the books of the Bible, and then I'm going to go through, uh, and I'm going to try and point those to the, help you connect what, uh, where that happened in this this small part of the world so if you look in your bible right in the back there are these same maps but i'm going to give you the simple version because i want you to be able to sit down with somebody and say hey here's how it works here's and uh, you'll see how i do that but here are the real maps too and you could sit down with somebody and look at these maps or you can look them up on the internet just type in uh, jesus map of jesus life uh jerusalem what was jerusalem like and the, there's plenty of maps out there but the bible also has maps and if you're in doubt obviously go with the ones that are in the bible you know sometimes the ones on the internet could they could be whatever you want so here's if you want to sit down and talk to somebody about god about jesus life or even about moses's life this is all you have to do you'd say well over in Israel, in, in uh, the Middle East, on the sea, Mediterranean Sea, there is a Sea of Galilee. And the, from the Sea of Galilee flows the Jordan River. And that Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the saltiest body of water on the earth. 
it's called the Dead Sea because nothing can live in it, not even fish or vegetation because there's so much salt in it. But that's where the Jordan River flows into. And this is the Sea of Galilee. Jerusalem is right about here. This would be the Mediterranean coast. So this is the Mediterranean Sea, which is if you went and uh, sailed your boat from the coast of the of Israel, the Promised Land, from through the Mediterranean Sea, you'd eventually get to Italy or or Rome or some of those other places. But this is what I want you to be thinking about: the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, and the city, the Holy City of Jerusalem. This land in and around these bodies of water is called many, many things. Israel, today you call it modern day Israel. It was called the promised land. It was called the land of Canaan. Um, there's a lot of different references to the holy land or the promised land or the land of Canaan through, throughout the Bible. All right, so here is your quick primer of the books of the Bible. And I'm gonna go through this really quickly because again, I don't want, I'm not, I'm not concerned about you being an expert on it, but I do want you to have a general overview of where the Bible is and, and how it happened. So the first books of the Bible are the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. And that is the oldest part of the Bible. And that is uh, often in the other parts of the Bible when they refer to the scriptures or they talk about people reading the Bible or the book of the law, they're referring to these first five books. And that's the story of creation, right? Genesis, the, the, the story of the Moses leading his people out of Egypt. Egypt would have been this way. <laughs> uh, the Genesis, Exodus, and then uh, the wandering in the wilderness and the establishment of the, the tabernacle or the, the, the uh, sacrifice system with the Levite. Levit Leviticus, the Levitical priesthood. Um, those first five books cross in and out of the Holy Land. In Genesis, uh, we see the, the beginning of creation. We see uh, the, the promise to Noah that God will never flood the earth again. We're not really even sure where that was, um, where, where uh, Noah's ark eventually landed. Um, but we also have the promise, the covenant with Abraham. Abraham was promised that if he left his land, which would have been this way, and followed God's guidance to go and live in a land that, that he was unfamiliar with, he didn't know, that God would provide for him. He would bless him make his descendants more numerous than the sand on the seashore or the stars in the sky, that he would give him a name, uh, wealth, sheep, uh, provide for him. And this is the most important one in my book. He said, I will bless you so that you can be a blessing for others. And that truly is what God did through the faith of Abraham. He created from him the tribe of Israel, which... Um, were the people that lived in this this holy land and uh, through the tribe of Israel, through Jerusalem, through the temple, through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, through all those traditions, God prepared for us the ability to, to see him and what he's doing in the world, primarily through Jesus Christ, but also through all the history of the Bible. So that's the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. If you're looking, thinking about the Bible, the first five books are the Law or the Pentateuch. And then you get a bunch of other books which are called the History. And this is most of the Bible is found in the History and the Major and Minor Prophets. So you can always divide the Bible up into first five books, Pentateuch. Then the next section is the History books, starting with Jeremiah, or uh, with uh, Joshua and Judges, and uh, 
all the way through first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, really just a history of the, the kingdoms that were established in Jerusalem. All of this history happens right here and in the division of all the tribes of Israel, this kingdom. And then after the history in the Bible, talking about this book, right? In this book are a bunch of smaller books. After the history books, you'll run into the poetry. And this is the, uh, the book of Job, the Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs and Song of Songs. And that's where you get some of the, this literally is Psalms, was literally the, the book of music. It would have been their podcast or their, uh, their uh, Spotify account back then of all their favorite songs and the words to those songs. Uh, they didn't look them up on YouTube, right, for the video or the words or the, the uh, lyrics. They had it written down in the book of Psalms instead. After you get through the poetry, you run into the major prophets and the minor prophets, and that makes up the second half of the Old Testament. The major prophets are called the major prophets just because they, they uh, talked about, the, well, ma mainly because their books are longer, <laughs> but also because of uh, some of the things that they predicted and pointed to. Um, they're also the earlier prophets that talk about what's going to happen to Jerusalem and what happened in Jerusalem and, and afterwards. Um, the minor prophets tend, most of their stories happened after Daniel and um, the the exile of, of the people um, from Jerusalem to Babylon, which would have been kind of back where Abraham came from. So there's the Pentateuch, there's some history books, there's some poetry from that history, and then there's the prophets, the writing of the prophets that that lived during that those historical times. The major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then the minor prophets, all the way from Hosea to Malachi. And you guys uh, may remember learning those books, right? And uh, that was always kind of the hardest point, top part, that the end of the Old Testament ending with Malachi. Um, just a bunch of really interesting names. All right, that's the Old Testament. And then you get about uh, you know, a thousand years, give or take, where uh, you don't really know what happened in the history of the promised land until you get to the New Testament. Actually, you, you do know, but um, it's really not worth recording much of it until Jesus shows up on the scene. And so in the beginning of the New Testament, you get the, the history picks up again, and you learn about Jesus under the Roman Empire. And so Jesus, born in, right? Remember, his Mary was visited by angel in Nazareth. She travels to Bethlehem, which is right by Jerusalem. And uh, she has her baby in Bethlehem. And then she travels to Egypt. And then she comes back and Jesus grows up in and around the Sea of Galilee. A big part of his life was being a farmer and carpenter in the rural part of the Promised Land in Israel. Same traditions uh, that are throughout the Bible. The, he grew up learning about the books of the law, reading some of the books of the prophets, singing the psalms that are found in the same Bible that we use. And then about 30 years old, he gets baptized in the Jordan River during a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And from that point on, his, his ministry just took off and he became a very popular guy. Uh, everywhere he went, people wanted to talk to him or touch his cloak so they could be healed. Um, he really couldn't go anywhere without getting uh, having a mob of people following him. And he changed a lot of people's lives, did a lot of healing, did a lot of teaching. But what was most important that he did was was not just that he was a great teacher, but that he he was a glimpse of God 
in human flesh. He was an incarnation of God. He, we, we truly believe that Jesus was God walking and talking on the earth, not only the son of God, but God himself. We talk about him as the son of God because that's just a, a, one of the references he used for himself, but he also said very clearly, I am, I am the one sent by God. I am God. I am the one that, I am the word of life. I am, I am the greatest glimpse you're going to get of God until I come again and, and bring you to God himself. We call that the Trinity. Um, so the New Testament's all about Jesus and what happened after he died and was resurrected from the dead. So your first four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you get Acts, which is the history of the Acts of the Apostles. So these are historical documents, all depicting, telling the story, the biography of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. The book of Acts tells the history of the early church. So what happened right after Jesus' death and crucifixion, uh, the, how many people witnessed his resurrection and, and how that affected them and, and all the stuff that was going on in the world at that time. And then the, uh, after those five books of, of uh, history, you get a bunch of letters. So there was a church in, in Jerusalem and there was a church in, in Rome and then there was a church in, in Ephesus and uh, in Galatia and uh, Corinth. And those are, you could go to Corinth uh, Greece right today if you wanted to you could you could uh, fly a plane there and, and land there and walk where Jesus walked or where Paul walked and uh, and these are real places and so they when the after Jesus death and resurrection and the Holy Spirit became more and more real in people's lives and and the church began uh, they started sending letters back and forth to each other just to talk about, hey, what do you do in this type of situation? How do we take care of the poor? How do we, um, we, we got someone in our church who's, who's just likes to gossip and, and say bad things, mean things about other people. What do we do about that situation? And so um, it was very important that they, they, they kept those letters and that's what the back half of the Bible is the New Testament. We got uh, the most important books, of course, are the Gospels, which you find right about here. And uh, there's the Gospel of John, and then Acts, and then in the back part of the Bible are all the the Psalms, or not not the Psalms, the letters. The biggest section are the letters that we attribute to Paul. Uh, they were either written by him or his his um, scribes that wrote wrote for him. And then the other last part of the letters are written by Peter and John and Jude and other apostles that walked and talked with Jesus. And so it's very important to, to get their letters about what they thought and what they believed. And, be, and perhaps one of the most famous books of the Bible is the last one, the book of Revelation. And that's the, the, the vision that the apostle John had of, of what the end of the world might look like. And, uh, and we did, in that book it's it's really important to remember it's a vision it wasn't a it wasn't a uh, a documentary that that uh, spells out exactly what it's going to look like it was it was john saying hey i had this vision i think it's really important so here it is word for word this is what i experienced this is what happened and then we we spent the rest of our lives uh trying to figure out what that vision meant and we won't truly know until we get to heaven and talk to God ourselves. So that's the, that's the Bible. This is the Old Testament, the New Testament, the promised land, the city of Jerusalem. You're gonna, I don't know how many times the, the, the city of Jerusalem is mentioned throughout the Bible, but also Galilee, the Jordan River, um, real places that we could visit today. And, uh, as we talked about last week or two weeks ago before Christmas, there were uh, there were more than 40 authors of the Bible. Uh, there was three different languages that the Bible was written in. It was written on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. And uh, or it tells uh, experiences of people in those different areas. 
and it was written over a 1500 year period from the the first revelation of genesis to abraham to the final vision of john on the island of patmos that was a 1500 year period of time uh, of history and it is our best glimpse that we'll ever have until we until we meet god face to face of who god is and and how he works in the world so we read these stories because they tell us who god is and what he's promised to do in our lives and and it's been proven throughout time every other book that's been written since the bible um, that talks about god um, in the christian church alludes to hey i had this ex very similar experience to paul or i had this very similar experience to ruth or john or jude all books and people from a, a different era a different time in history so one last thing that i want you to know about the bible before we move on and that is that this is a tool this is a book to be used sometimes we think of it as sacred a holy bible and it is it's very important that um, you don't use it for other things um, like uh, holding up a wobbly table or something but it is to, meant to be used. So that means you're allowed to, you know, dog ear it. You're allowed to put things in it. You're allowed to write in it. You're allowed to highlight it. You're, you're right, uh, you should take notes, underline things that, that matter to you. And when you hear God saying something to you, write it down in the margin or write it down on a piece of paper and tuck it in that Bible because that's how God speaks to us through the Bible still today when we, when we read these stories of other people. The last thing I want you to do is take your Bible. I hope you do have one of these student Bibles. If you don't do this later, write this down. Page one, 1,423 is the, the uh, index for your Bible. Um, that's where it starts. It ends on 1458. And that's a really interesting um, section too, because if, if you're ever in doubt, you ever come to a time where you're you're really wrestling you're feeling lost you you don't you're wondering what to do next uh, you feel distant from god or you just feel distant from your friends or your family um, sometimes you don't even really know what you're struggling with you could turn to page 1459 and there's just a list of words right anger arrogance attitudes authority the boss cheating commitment and you might read through that list and uh, you'd be like, oh, that's, that sounds like what I'm struggling with. And then you can read Ruth chapter one to talk about, that talks about commitment. The other way to use your Bible is to use the actual index. And that is, starts on page 1423. Take your Bible out, look at it. This is your homework to, for today is to actually just after you're done with this video, with mom or dad or on your own, just read through the index and look at all the different topics that there are that the Bible talks about. Real life things that matter for us today, like abilities or abortion or addiction or advice or alcohol or anger or approval. You have any? You have any uh, uh, struggle with getting uh, wanting too much approval or? Um, not getting the approval of your parents that you want. Appearances, do we, do we worry about our appearances too much, especially in today's culture? Um, as long as it's, you know, just the eyes, right? Because we're always wearing masks. Uh, this is a wonderful tool, guys. And it's very applicable. It applies to your life and it's very user-friendly. It's just a matter of opening that up to that back section, looking for the thing that you're, that you're concerned about, like, um, what should I eat? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe you're worried about, um, I'm really sad. I, I, I'm crying a lot. What does the Bible have to say about that? Look for the section on sadness and tears and, and grief or crying, and you'll find out what other people experienced in sadness and how God was a part of their life and walked with them in that time. So this is your Bible. I want you to use it. Read it, number one. Number two, mark it up. Number three, you don't need to be an expert, right? We're not experts in the Bible, but we we should be plenty confident to pick it up and read it and talk about it with somebody else. If you have a friend that asked you a question about the Bible, 
you already know right now, having sat through this, everything you need to know to open that up and say, I don't know, let's see what it says. Uh, I definitely encourage you to memorize it. That's an old tradition that's served the test of time. People um, have memorized the, the Bible and certain verses. And uh, once you memorize it, can't ever be taken away from you. And you'd be surprised at what times in your life that, that Bible verse that you memorized comes back up. Um, and then anytime you're facing a hard decision, open that Bible up, read that, use that index, look at, um, find the part that you're, the, the decision that you're facing and, uh, and you can help a friend too. So if one of your friends comes to you and, and says, Hey, I'm, I'm struggling with, uh, vaping. I'm really addicted to it. I can't stop doing it. You can open that Bible up and say, well, here's something, here's what it has to say about addiction. Here's what it has to say about being honest with your, your friends and your family. This is how you get help when you're scared and, 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 and you're worried about um, what the next thing is. And you know what you're going to find out? The Bible says God loves you. Your parents love you. People in authority love you. And they're going to be more excited that they can help you struggle with that struggle of addiction than be upset that you got stuck in it in the first place, right? It's not about the, it's not about how we fall down. It's about how we get back up and we need each other, our parents, our friends, our family to help us do that. And that's the story of the Bible. God putting people in our lives to help us when we fall down. I want to thank you guys for reading this video, uh, watching this video. And uh, we are uh, got a lot of fun things starting in January and February. I invite you to look at the website. Um, ask mom and dad about their reminds. Hey, if it's been a while since you've been to church because of uh, COVID and all the restrictions that are around that, there's a lot of safe things that we're doing and we're taking all the precautions. Like you, you do have to wear a mask when you're here and we're taking temperatures when we gather together. Um, but hey, if you're looking for um, just some, some friends to hang out with and talk with, at the very least, text them. Um, stay connected with your friends here at church. Uh, that's very important in this time. God bless you guys. Uh, God loves you guys. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you once again.